Electrical, machining, piano making, plumbing, spinning, tanning, weaving and welding trades. After working in various divisions of the Australian Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, known as CSIRO, he now writes about science in encyclopedias and textbooks and he publishes cookbooks. Pat is also the editor of Numbers and Measurements section for the Australian Government's Style Manual for Writers, Editors and Printers. As a consultant on measurement, Pat speaks regularly to business owners and professional groups in Canada, the UK and here in the USA. Please join me in welcoming at Google, Pat Norton. One other note before we continue, um, this is going external. So if you have questions that may relate, relate to Google confidential information, please leave them until after uh, the audio visual is turned off. Thank you. Can make them make the questions easy so I can answer them and don't make me look too silly. And the way this talk will work is because I've got a cold in the head and hardly any voice at all. Um, if you want to interrupt, please interrupt any time. I don't care, and we'll um, take it as we go. I may cut you a bit short if I think it's more important that we do the whole presentation, but ask questions as we go. I thought that I was going to give a talk today that talked about successes of the metric system in Australia. But it didn't work out because there were so many issues that kept coming into my mind about the importance of metric issues and metrication, the process of metrication, which is my speciality. I don't much care about the metric system because I reckon I could learn it again in under a week. It's a pretty simple thing. But the thing that fascinates me and has fascinated me over the last 30 years is how people react to the metric system with absolute hatred sometimes, with absolute enthusiasm at other times. And all of those issues fascinate me. And it's a, the way that humans react, I think, that gets me. Let's talk about one of the issues that came up in a cooking book. And the purpose of telling you a story here is twofold. One is to talk about the whole tradition of how measurement systems work. And basically, this story is about my wife and she, her mother was suffering what proved to be terminal Alzheimer's and she was in a nursing home and my wife decided that she would um, prepare a cookbook and she'd get all the old ladies in the nursing home to contribute to the cookbook and she got a great stack of papers, some of them in old school copy books, some of them on pieces of paper, some of them written around the sides of newspaper qualifying you know, the recipe in the country magazines. And one particular recipe came, and it came from a lady who was in her late 90s. And in a very shaky hand at the top of the page were written the words, this recipe came to me from my great, great, great grandmother. And Wendy put this in front of me, and said, what's a gill? I said, I don't know. I'll Google it, <laughs> which I did, and discovered you can pronounce it gill or jill. And, but she said, how much is it? Because I need to tell the people, if we're going to be able, people are going to be able to cook this old lady's recipe, how much do you tip in when you get a gill of stuff? So I spent a half an hour on Google, 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 and soon had a little list of 35 different definitions of what a gill was. My favourite was a French coffee cup politely filled. <laughs> but there were a whole heap of others. And I then realised that Wendy had a problem, not a measurement problem, with her cookbook, but she had a problem with tradition. Here was a recipe that came to me from my great, great, great grandmother 
And that old lady wanted to pass it on and she had some great, great, oops, sorry, great, great grandchildren, granddaughters, in fact. So how could she pass on that tradition? Because those two young girls, in a few years' time, if they inherited this book, they'd come across the word gill. Maybe they'd Google it um, the same way I did and then get so totally confused that they couldn't make that fruitcake for their families. So the tradition would die. So I pointed out to my wife that she had a little problem. Her little problem that was that she only had one choice and that was to write the entire cookbook in metric units and then she would have to test cook everything. This proved to be a very worthwhile experience. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and uh, the purpose of telling you that story is to tell you about, it's not always just measurement issues, there's cultural issues, there's, there's um, tradition issues and so on in every measurement thing. Let's talk about another small issue, oh, big issue. I was looking at this because some people asked me to write a submission to the Australian government on energy and the energy requirements that we have a Senate over there and um, I was putting a, Senate, a, a submission to a Senate inquiry on how to measure energy and I was looking at this and I looked at it first of all in an energy context and there, there's a whole heap of old pre-metric energy units. It isn't like Gill, these ones have all got different names um, here's some of them. And I soon realised that there were, I found, Google, 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 I do that a lot. Um, I found um, all of these different names and things like um, British thermal units. Because British thermal units are so temperature dependent, um, the British thermal unit at 0 degrees Celsius, and believe me there is one, um, is not the same as the British thermal unit at 16 degrees and it's not the same as 68 degrees Fahrenheit and so on. Similarly, if you get into calories, those of you who um, uh, read about calories, especially in Weight Watching and Weight Thing uh, magazines, um, I found 22 different kinds of calories. Uh, the most predominant difference is capital C calories versus little c calories, which are a thousand times different. But all the others are uh, percentage points above and below. Um, above or below what? There is no norm in, in calories. There is no standard definition because people make up their definition all the time. In fact, the lady who introduced the word calorie into human food calcul human food discussions um, was a lady by the name of Dr Lulu Hunt-Peters and she, uh, when she introduced this into the United States, uh, she defined a calorie, and I suppose it still is, as the amount of heat needed to heat four pounds of water by one degree Fahrenheit. But that's just for the physicists amongst us. Um, so uh, when I looked at those and I realised I was writing this report for senators. Now, senators in Australia are probably much the same here. They're what you call politicians. Now, politicians in Australia, I imagine that in the United States of America, a great place like this, would be no trouble at all for a politician to understand exactly all of those 95 different ways of describing energy. So when, it, when a politician here was thinking about global warming and energy issues and global warming, they'd have no trouble. Um, and they'd have no trouble with the different 8,930 conversion factors they needed to uh, convert between one and the other. I suspect that the Australian politicians aren't so smart. And in fact, when they got their report and they looked at all these things, they wrote away a lot of letters to our scientific organisations saying, um, what is an inch pound force and stuff like that because they didn't know. And our um, very small nuclear industry put in issues about atomic energy units our very large oil industry put in lots of words about barrels of oil equivalents, whatever that might happen to mean. 
because I was in the United States two years ago and I went to Texas to the oil museum down at Midland, I think it's at, uh, the Permian Basin Oil Museum, and asked them what a barrel was. And they kindly told me that it never existed and they just make it up at random when they... Um, so that was uh, the way that polit our politicians, I think, get terribly confused because otherwise they'd have to consider the metric unit of energy, um, which, as you know, is a jewel. Oh, by the way, um, that's a complete list, and it's been a complete list since 1889. Um, all of those others have been redundant, actually, since 1889. But people habitually use them. Sometimes it's just out of habit. Um, sometimes it's to give credit to uh, one, of their, uh, one of their friends, you know, that might be named after Hartree or it might be named after a person. But the only metric unit of energy is the joule. Of course, sometimes the joules are fairly small and sometimes you have to use the uh, multiples. Yeah, mate? It was. It was part of an old metric system. That's why um, I said old pre-metric. Yeah, that's an inaccuracy on that slide. Thank you. Um, um, sorry, yeah. Uh, wasn't an ERG an old uh, metric energy unit? Yes, it was. Um, but since 1960, when the SI, the Systeme International d'Unité, uh, came in, it is now regarded as redundant and no longer useful. Um, so these days I use these and when I did the report to the Australian government I used petajoules for Australian energy requirements and I also did a comparison with all, all of the energy use in the United States of America and I used exajoules. It was, uh, but then you can see straight away that the energy that comes from wind energy in proportion to size, if they're all in exajoules, it's just a matter of comparing the numbers where if they, some of them are in atomic energy units and some of them are in barrels of oil equivalent, it's very difficult to make any comparisons. This slide is a remnant, really, of my first approaches to talking to you today, and it was one of the things we learnt early on in our pretty successful metrication in Australia that metrication is inevitable. Since it started, as you know, or as most folk know, I'm sure, the metric system was invented on a Monday. And since that Monday, the metric process has been unstoppable. It's been unstoppable in every country in the world. It, even if there is absolutely no government support for it at all, say, for example, in Burma, also known as Myanmar, if there's no support for it at all, their entire drug industry um, uh, sells things in kilograms, mostly to the United States market. But the international trade all goes with the metric system, and there's a number of reasons for that, and I'll, I'll explore those. But metrication is inevitable, and it doesn't matter... Um, where it starts. Consider metric cars. Metric cars started probably one day, don't know which day, when an engineer, a fella by the name of Ferdinand Porsche, decided that he would make a metric car. He engineered the car he looked at all the possibilities for that, in, that particular car and he discovered, or no, he deliberately made it so that it only had three, uh, three nut sizes on all the bolts. Um, there were 28 millimetre nuts on the four wheels and on the steering wheel, so there were five of those. And you didn't need the, span the wrench for that very often so he could hang that on his garage wall. Every other, every other bolt on that first car, the 1934 car that he made, every other bolt on that car was either a 10 millimetre bolt or a 13 millimetre bolt. And that meant that a mechanic 
with a pocket on the side of his trouser, could have the one and only spanner he needed with a 10 millimetre end and a 30, 13 millimetre end to engineer the entire car. The savings in cost, in labour costs, in understanding costs and so on, uh, were so great for Porsche that that car eventually became what we fondly knew in Australia as the pregnant pasty, um, or the Volkswagen um, Beetle. And that car was so successful and so economically sound that now every single car in the world copied off Ferdinand Porsche. Now, when you bought your all-metric all, all car, the one you now drive, I don't think anybody here drives a car pre-75, yes? Yeah, what is it? Hey? You don't have it anymore. I still have my 75 um, Volkswagen, uh, what they call a minibus thing. Um, but it too was an all metric car with the two spanner sizes. The point is that every industry, every car maker in the world, in the United States, in Japan, in Europe, every single car maker in the world copied off this engineer. And uh, Porsche, uh, even with his own cars that still sell in his own name, um, all have all metric parts and so on. In an average car, just as a throwaway line, in an average United States car, there are 10,000 parts. They take an average of about 10 measures. Uh, washers have outside diameter, inside diameters and thicknesses, but a panel like that front mudguard might have as many as 30. So there's about 100,000 measurements in a car and they are all metric. Um, but the um, industry in the United States is very, very clever. And if you put the letters MPH in front of the driver, he won't know that he's driving an all metric car. Um, and that's common here. Motorbikes were the last to change over to metric fully. Uh, the Harley Davidson, I think, was the last one and uh, it now is all metric as well. Um, metric earth moving equipment has, whoop, sorry about that. Metric earth moving equipment has been metric for a fair long time, probably about the 70s. And if you take something like the Kennecott mine um, in Utah, um, this little uh, truck here, uh, its tires are four metres high from top to bottom. Um, and this uh, truck uh, sits in the bottom of the mine and it gets loaded by that uh, uh, one bucket full of um, uh, that loader there and the loader uh, dumps 100 tonnes at a time and they're T-O-N-N-E-S, those tonnes, because every from the blasting from the rock face to the putting of the, uh, all the parts in all of the digger and in all of the trucks are all metric. Then they get carted up to uh, where they're chemically treated, the, the uh, minerals and ores are tre chemically treated at the top of the mine, and chemists have worked in total metric all the way along the line. Then they have an electrolytic process to purify the uh, copper, all using metric amps and metric um, volts and so on. And then you bring out this lovely uh, ingot of pure copper and you label it 500 pounds. Otherwise people would know and how shameful it is that you're working in metric because in the United States it is, there are many, many industries that are sort of seething up with all this metric stuff but they don't want to tell anyone. However, that doesn't stop the fact that metrication is inevitable. It's unstoppable. It will continue doing its um, thing and Think about the computer you drive. Is there anyone here who hasn't got a computer? <laughs> um, and to the component parts that are designed and cut and so on and, uh, in nanometers and the dimensions of the, uh, uh, of the conductors all across the chips in uh, micrometers and then the little legs hanging off the side in millimetres and the design of the thing across here and the case itself all done in millimetres and then just so um, everybody can know what you're doing you call the screen 15.4 inches or 
something. Petrication is inevitable. Uh, I haven't over made this point, have I? I just don't want to. Yeah. But I do believe that no individual, no group, no company, no nation that's ever used as metric for any time has ever gone permanently back to using pre-metric measures. Yeah. Yep, and uh, what I'm hearing from some of the engineers is they're now doing the engineers in metric, then dumbing them down for the contractors so that uh, the, the contractors don't know that they're doing metric um, design work, because the metric design work, once you get used to doing it, is quite easy. The same thing happened in the United Kingdom, but let's consider the extreme case there. Um, they have, uh, they do all their design and all their construction in the United Kingdom in uh, metric. And um, I was driving over there a couple of weeks ago and every hundred metres along the road is a little blue post that tells you how many metres you are from one city or another. Then when you go 1,609.344 metres, you get a sign that says one mile. And that's for the, the equivalent of the MPH on cars. It's just um, the government there has made it uh, legal to have uh, mile signs on all metric roads. I don't know how much there is in this country, but I do know a lot of the engineers that I deal with here are hanging in there for the metric because it's so easy, but they're having to put the signs up in thing. Yes, sir. The permanently modifier there is that think about um, when Napoleon came to power in France. He said, right, uh, we're stopping all this metric nonsense. And uh, the people who'd been using the metric system for uh, well, about 10 or 15 years by then, uh, they kept using it underneath the uh, bringing back the old measures. And then about another uh, 20 years on, the whole country went back to metric again. Um, I don't know of any case uh, in the United States it's still in abeyance, um, but I don't know of any case where anyone is, they do the dithering bit. Um, you go to metric, away from it, to it, away from it, and then say, oh, well, the hell with it, and we'll get on with it, um, is the sort of thing. We were able in Australia, a friend of mine was uh, one of the technical experts on the metric conversion board, and we were able to identify four main ways that Australia went to metric that might be useful to you. We had four approaches. One of them was what we call direct metrication, the direct approach, where you took metric as an opportunity to re-engineer your, your, uh, your whole job. For instance, in the building construction industry, our stud spacings in walls used to be 18 inches apart. And when the metric conversion possibility came along, the industry, the construction industry said, oh, great, we can get rid of the, all those old 4B2s, or I think you call them 2B4s here, this is a technical difference. And um, we made them uh, exactly 35 millimetres by 90 millimetres, gave them a little bit more structural strength by uh, specifying better product um, before it went into the wall um, and shifted them from 18 inches out to 600 millimetres. So effectively from 450 millimetres out to 600 millimetres, which meant that in every wall you were saving uh, one quarter, is it? Quarter of all the studs in every wall, in every house, in every building, in every flat, in every apartment, in every um, high-rise construction. And the industry saved a lot of money by doing that. Um, uh, I'll mention it here. They estimated that they saved 10% on turnover um, in industries where they were able to do this direct metrication. They reckoned they saved about 10% on turnover and about they increased their net profits by about 15%. Um, I don't know if that's interesting to Google, but um, they're... 
interesting things. We also had this hidden metrication where people went metric but didn't tell their customers or didn't tell their partners. And this is the one I described to you before that the English are doing with their roads. They, uh, uh, they do them all in metric but then they don't tell the public about it. It's also what uh, the um, United States uh, motor industry does with their cars as well. Metric conversion is a very interesting issue. Metric conversion is where you sort of say, OK, let's go metric, but we'll have double-sided rulers. OK, let's go metric for clothing sizes, for instance, and we'll have cl women's clothing, for instance, for a 24-inch waist, and we'll make the skirt length 37 centimetres. Um, and a lot of that went on. As it happened, um, uh, Paul mentioned that I'm a farmer by background, uh, which is not a good trade or a practice in Australia because we have the biggest and the best droughts that you have ever seen. And in between a good quality drought, you get bushfires. Anyway, I'm no longer in the farming business, <laughs> but I went into building construction, so I know a little bit about that. <clears throat> and then later I went into the textile trade um, and worked in, um, in particular in wool production and in wool testing and measurement. So I saw a number of trades who went, used direct met metrication. I saw not many using hidden metrication. I saw a lot using uh, metric conversion. And I saw a few, but not many in Australia, who used the philosophy, if you ignore it, it'll go away. Um, and there's still a few around like that. Um, Let's talk first of all about direct metrication. It, what you need to do is you've got to really be clear on what goals you've got and how you're going to achieve them. Uh, they've got to be written. Um, if they're not written and you have a general policy, we are going to go metric, then uh, people will make individual decisions and some will decide on direct metrication, some will decide on metric conversions, some will decide on ignore it and it'll go away. Um, and others, you know, do other things. Um, one of the successes we had was with things like M days and other time markers. Uh, road signs were an example. Um, our road signs people, keep in mind that the continent of United States, the continental United States, is about the same size as Australia. So we've got a lot of roads. Um, they, we don't have as many population as you, but we've got roads going all around the country, especially on the east and south coast. Um, so we had a lot of road signs to fix. So what they did was they created their budget this way. They let the old signs get run down, basically, over about 18 months to two years. They then picked an M day, a road signs day, and that was a Sunday, and it was the first Sunday in July in 1974. And they chose a Sunday because the traffic was lighter that day and they didn't have, you know, going to work traffic and such. And for the 18 months before that, they spent their budget on new signs, put them in position and then covered them over with Hessian sacking and stuff. Then on the Sunday that I talked about, they went and they cut them all off. From the public's point of view, it looked like the whole nation had changed over to metric signs in a day. There were letters to newspapers that said, oh, there'll be chaos on the roads, there'll be murder, there'll be mayhem. Didn't happen. Um, in fact, the two weeks after the signs were put up, there were less uh, deaths on the road, there were less injuries on the road, I suspect because people were more, more cautious for those two weeks. But that uh, Australian plan is subsequently used in India. It was used a year and a half ago, Paul, was it in Ireland? and they just changed the whole lot over um, in a day. In Canada, they used a slightly different technique. Instead of using the sacking technique over the new signs, they uh, let the signs run down and then made themselves uh, decals, I think they're called, uh, stick-on signs, and they went around on their Sunday and just stuck them on. Um, worked for them. Again, it looked like it was done in a day. With direct metrication, there's no conversions. You're not converting from one thing to another because you, you change over to the new thing and you just do it. 
It needs strong leadership because, and strong, uh, strong implementation from all of the industry that you're doing it in. Um, some industries um, uh, changed uh, over, did that day plan and had a metric day or an M day plan. Um, but you needed pretty good um, leadership from the top um, to do those sort of changes. You also had to have clear policy statements. Um, and most of them used the opportunity of metrication to resolve other issues. For instance, in one chemistry laboratory I was associated with, they decided that they would have a tea day for all their, all their temperatures. So they changed all the temperatures over to um, uh, Celsius uh, in one day. And to do that, they also took the opportunity to get rid of all their old mercury-based um, uh, thermometers that they had in their laboratories, because they always were dangerous whenever you broke them. You got mercury th fumes through the place. So they decided that they'd get rid of all of those and, as a health and safety issue at the same time. And uh, so there's always opportunities once you start on the process. Um, for instance, this is an example, the Australian Building Construction Policy simply stated that the metric units for linear measurement will be the millimetre, um, the metre and the kilometre. But they knew that they'd get into um, issues with people who reckoned, ah, oh, but this gives us two bigger numbers and these centimetres will, be will be better. So they specified that the centimetre <coughs> shall not be used and the centimetre shall not be used in any calculation and it should never be written down. The net result of that was that metrication of the building construction industry in Australia was smooth, rapid and effectively completed within one year. I know of only two um, uh, subcontractors who maybe went for two years and one of those at least I know the managing director was going home at night time with these metric drawings, crossing out all the metric numbers and putting in feet and inches. Um, so, you know, there were people who fought hard uh, to keep the old things, but everybody else changed over within a year. And keep in mind, when I was working in the building industry with this, I surveyed them fairly closely and we came up with figures that it was saving in turnover around at least 10%, but we figured about 10% and increasing net profits by about 15%. Um, not only for the uh, building contractor themselves, but also for all their subcontractors, the plumbers, the bricklayers, the carpenters and so on, they were all getting the benefit as well. On one occasion, um, uh, the company I worked for, AV Jennings and Company, they were the biggest um, makers, uh, home builders in all of Australia. Can't remember how many we were doing a year, but we were working uh, we only have uh, six states and we were working in four of them and we were the biggest in those four. Um, and uh, we were building uh, a lot of homes and so the boss, uh, old Bert Jennings, got us to build two houses side by side. One was built in imperial measures, the old feet and inches, and the other one was built in metric measures. And we kept all the wastes on the site so that we could see how, how the the comparison at the end of the job. When we looked at the wastes from the Imperial Feet and Inches house, there were two five ton trucks of waste was taken away from that job. And the waste from the uh, metric house wouldn't fit in a wheelbarrow. Um, so we had a dramatic evidence that we were saving a lot of money and we reckoned those figures I told you, 10% and 15%. Some people decided to issue instructions to their organisation to go metric without having a policy and without having a written documentation and such like. And I remember um, when that happened, you have to ask your question, who is going to actually set the policy? Because if you do that generic sort of thing, you can't know. I remember in a school that I saw, they decided that they would have dual scale thermometers. Or if you were looking at that school, you would say they decided. In fact, it was the receptionist who decided because part of her job was doing some purchasing work. Um, in another 
construction, no, it wasn't a construction company, they were a furniture company. Um, they decided on dual sided tapes and rulers because the storeman decided. And so without a policy, um, you can get some funny things happening, and they did happen to us. Um, in a, a laboratory that I was associated with, they all finished up with dual scale uh, weighing machines because one of the laboratory technicians got the job of doing the, uh, the research and she thought that uh, dual would be better because then they could do old and new on the thing. Um, what um, we came to realise was that it was an important principle and I think a principle that we learned from England that you don't duel with duel. Um, if you're going to do a, um, oops, sorry about that, if you're going to do a, um, a metrication program, you do it, get into it, get it done, get it out of the road and it'll be the quicker, be the ch cheaper, if it costs you anything at all. Um, so don't duel with duel. One of the issues that's uh, epitomised in all of this and this is something I had a lot of trouble, a, a extreme trouble with. This is an intellectual problem for me. I noticed the difference between direct metrication programs and these uh, conversion programs and these uh, ignore it and it'll go away programs and all the others. But what I didn't realise, the difference in time between them, and it was the timing difference that becomes crucially important, with a direct metrication program, well planned, you can do it in a year. But with a metric conversion program, like all of these um, uh, are part of really, it can take a hundred years. Now that is a hard thing for this poor little brain to get around, how something as silly or as simple as using dual scales can take so much longer. But I had to accept it because I saw it again and again and again and again in various places in Australian metrication programs. But then when I began to research this over the whole period from when the metric first started, you remember on that Monday I told you about, when the metric first, every single time people decided on this conversion thing, then or it was decided for them, perhaps by their receptionist or their um, uh, storeman, the, um, the difference between one year and a hundred years was too great. I had to accept it eventually that you don't duel with duel. Another thing that I had a lot of trouble with was whether mandatory uh, conversion programs versus voluntary ones. I was told that mandatory programs work quickly and I was told that Voluntary programs worked eventually, and I found it didn't matter. The truth is that both work. And it doesn't really matter as to their timing, whether it's mandatory or voluntary, as long as it's a direct metrication rather than a metric conversion is the important thing. If you've got, uh, the, the speed depends on the method you use, not on whether you, uh, somebody's made it mandatory or so on. Just on the mandatory thing, I mentioned earlier that in Australia we have a lot of um, bushfires and one of the early things with our voluntary um, bushfire or so bushfire fighting associations was they made metric measures mandatory so that if um, say these three guys in the front here were on a truck and one of them says ah oh, we better go over there 15 yards and put that out his truck leader would have to report him for using yards um, because he has uh, just endangered the life of everybody there, potentially, because we don't know uh, whether it's yards or feet or once we get into that thing. And so we did have some mandatory things like firefighters. Firefighters in Australia do not use any of the old measures. Um, and they're trained in how to estimate how many metres a thing is away, how to look across a valley and see whether something's um, f five kilometres from here and all of the other things. And if they try to use old measures, it, it is mandatory. Um, OK. <clears throat> the other thing we learned about early on was this whole business of whether we should use vulgar... I think they're called common fractions here is that the right term? Yeah, same thing. 
uh, common fractions and decimals, and engineers and generally numerate people like mathematicians, scientists and um, uh, other people who have strong numeracy skills, they'll almost bleat at me and say, but, but, but all you have to do is move the decimal point. And I remember being at a session with a group of plumbers and uh, the plumbers came out for their morning tea and I remember one plumber saying to the other one, what's a decimal? And his friend said, yeah, and what's the point? Because <laughs> they didn't understand this moving decimal points and things around because they uh, did things differently and uh, they had a better mindset. So in the building trade, we, came, we had a better thought that no fractions are necessary at all, ever. And we took a, a number of decisions that uh, would go down that path and that has proved to be enormously successful. And I've used that in a number of uh, trades. And it mostly comes around because of big numbers versus small numbers. If you get a number like this, 23,456 millimetres, a lot of people's first reaction is, oh, that's too big a number. People can't understand that. That's, by the way, about the length of my house. I've got a four bedroom house and that's the length of the one side wall, just to give you the size of scale. And a lot of people would like that to be written in centimetres and you just move the decimal point, uh, same length, whatever. As soon as you do that, though, others will use this technique of taking it back to the old mixed number thing where you do it in metres and centimetres and millimetres. Um, the Italian I have seen in Italy on working drawings on a job site there, this, this number with two decimal points, and I, I was in Paris about four weeks ago, um, and they, on, on one building site I was looking at, they were using this technique as well with two decimal points. Um, and so that's a big issue. In, uh, uh, on an Australian building site, if there's a line to show the back wall of my house, it will have this number there just written like that. And somewhere on the drawing, it'll have all dimensions uh, in millimetres. And it won't have any units at all next to any number and just have numbers all over the place. And they're all in millimetres. Now, the big advantage uh, we had with that, sorry, I'm out of order here. I'll go with this order. What we realised um, was that why direct metrication works so well is that all your numbers are ultimately um, simple. That even though 23,456 is a big number, it is a simple number. It is a number that you can put into a calculator. It's a number that um, a bricklayer's labourer can put into a calculator. And he doesn't have to have an engineer come around tomorrow to show him how to do it, um, to add up some lengths and so on. The, um, all the numbers that you use on a building job are honest. You know they're honest. You know that they're the same kind of number. Um, the, and they're specified. In overall things, I remember back in 1958, I was looking up why the international measuring community were trying to redefine the inch. And then I realised that the United States had two different inches. Um, one of them was a statute inch and one of them was a legal inch or something, I can't remember what. I didn't know then, but I know now, that in 1958, the um, British government had two different inches. Um, one of them was for armaments, guns and such, and one of them was for doing streets and houses. Um, so they had two different ones. And so every time you used the word inch, you didn't know whether which inch you were dealing with, but you always knew which metre and which millimetre you are dealing with. Um, the, you can always check up... Um, uh, it's open that you can always check up um, how uh, a unit is structured and so on, and they're worldwide. You can compare them. If I, if I tell you my, yeah, my house is 23,456 millimetres long, you can all uh, find out how long that is. This is opposed to the old 
uh, older units. All of them are more complicated. Think about uh, energy units if you're considering global warming. The units for uh, measuring in metric are simple. The units for measuring in all of the old measures are complicated. They're usually obscure. You usually have to have a long discussion as to what the meaning of any of those words mean. If I say to you the word calorie, then you need to consider what its definitions and what it me its meanings are. Often they're secret. Um, the the um, unit for measuring oil, which you see the price of in the paper every morning, is a barrel. But that barrel never actually existed. It was a secret of collusion, really, between the oil companies. Um, actually, I withdraw the word collusion because they did it independently and they made a number around about um, 42 gallons or 159 litres or something like that. But it wasn't open to the public and it still isn't. Uh, let me give you an example. This morning, say, the price of a barrel of oil quoted in the uh, New York Times let's say it was about $64. Um, at 159 litres, uh, that makes it about 40 cents a litre. Or in US gallons, say, um, where am I up to here, about $15 or something. Uh, sorry, $1.50. How much are you paying for your um, uh, gasoline at the moment? $3. So it's costing the company $1.50 and it's, you're paying $3. That's fair and reasonable, isn't it? OK. Now, in all of your minds, there are fair and reasonable arguments happening. And they are, but they've got to uh, distill it, they've got to market it, they've got to transport it, etc., etc. Is that fair? 20 seconds ago, you couldn't have done that calculation because you didn't know what a barrel was because it was secret. So these are the sorts of issues that happen. And most of them are territorial, that they belong to one particular group of people. And often this will be some sort of jargon and people will hang on to jargon units. They've named it for some famous fellow in their, in their business or something. OK. Back to millimetres or centimetres. I did a comparative study between the building industries in Australia and Canada. We did our entire uh, metrication program in a year. Um, I was in Canada only a week or two ago, and they, um, in Canada, um, it's taken them 37 years to try and um, do their changeover so far, and it'll take them a fair long time. I had high hopes for them, and I still do, because they're starting to look at the Australian experience, and they're saying 37 years is too long why don't we go back to the Australian way and do it in a, in a year? So maybe they'll do that. Kodak is more or less a, um, a controlled experiment in many ways. Kodak in 1910 um, uh, decided, uh, George Eastman was their managing director and a very uh, vivacious sort of a man and a decision maker of some note, and he came into the business in 1910 and said, right, we're going metric. And different people made different decisions as to how that might work. In the film division, they decided to use millimetres. In the paper division, they de decided to use centimetres. The film division was, was all over by the bar the shouting by the end of 1911. Now, these weren't just the little film sizes, they were also the big films for chest X-rays and all that stuff. So, there were various uh, sizes. It was all over by 1911. If you go into a store anywhere in the San Francisco area, or London, or Geelong, where I come from, and go to, into a, ask for a Kodak thing, they will g tell you, ah, we've got these lovely four, four by sixes, or six by fours, um, which, uh, because their paper division decided to work in centimetres, centimetres almost always take with them conversion factors on how to get back to inches. And so, where are we? 1910 till 2007, 97 years later, they're still struggling. Um, 
I also saw the same thing happen with um, builders and textile workers. Builders were all over finished in a year using millimetres. Textile workers are still struggling 37 years later using centimetres. One of the reasons for this is that millimetres come as whole numbers. The precision on a building site, if it's to one millimetre, um, will be in whole numbers and you'll get uh, people will work and try to cut something to a millimetre. Um, so if a textile worker is, say, making a, uh, a tailored vest, she, the tailor might want to work better than a centimetre accuracy. So when they get past centimetres, they usually then go into uh, halves or quarters. And there's one notable um, person in your trade, uh, a fellow by the name of Bill Gates, I think his name is. And he, if you, you look in Microsoft Word, convert it into metric units, it'll go into centimetres, and the centimetres will be divided into halves and quarters. Um, it's no longer a decimal system the way uh, it's applied there. Um, also, millimetres gave all whole numbers, where centimetres gave mixed numbers, like how many uh, metres of cloth uh, might be three metres plus 23 centimetres plus uh, um, some millimetres or a half or something. And these proved to be difficult for the workers in the factories to deal with. So let's look at the approaches to the metric system and summarise a bit. That if you try the ignore it and go away um, procedure, um, one uh, uh, organisation that have done this pretty consistently are the uh, uh, theologians and Bible scholars when they translate from old texts in Aramaic or Hebrew, Hebrew or whatever. When they come to a measuring word like uh, hin or bath or cubit, they don't touch it, they leave it there. And there's a reason for that. Over the various books, they change in length and size um, according to the context. Um, but so they just ignore it and hope this, all this metric measurement thing will go away. And basically, um, they're working on a, probably about a 10,000 year time scale. The hidden metrication thing, um, one of the measures that uh, you're all experiencing right now um, is a thing called shoe size. When you go to buy some shoes and you say, I'll have a pair of shoes that are size, uh -uh seven or eight or whatever. Do you always get shoes that fit perfectly and uh, wonderfully and, and so on? I don't. Um, how bad is that? In my case, I'm a very bad shoe buyer. And to me, maybe one in four will not do what it needs to do. And I, um, I'll say things like, oh, perhaps they'll stretch or you know, I'll wear them in. Um, but um, generally it doesn't. Um, so shoe sizes were set at that um, length of a barley corn, full and round, chosen from the middle of the year in 1215 when Magna Carta was signed. So I think in terms of hidden metrication, perhaps taking a thousand years. Metric conversion, the experience seems to be that that takes about a hundred years, minimum-ish and direct metrication, 85% of industries in Australia, um, about a year. And uh, uh, that's just the way it worked out for us. We were lucky that a lot of our industries did that and that direct metrication was successful for us for a social reason, which I'll now look at. And that is the idea of social proof. Think about this, you're in Singapore <coughs> and you're standing on the side of the street and there's a red light, pedestrian light, a red character standing with this light there. Three people come to stand next to you, three people come to stand opposite the road, the man's still sitting there with a red light. Two of these people start to walk across the road and all three of those start to walk across the road, how do you feel? The red light is still there. Do you wait for the red light or do you look at what's happening to the local people, you think they're local people, and you go with them? I don't know. Mostly I go with them. 
um, especially in Singapore and in London, you do that. Um, in the not United States, I don't. Um, I have no courage at all in the United States because most of the drivers are driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> Pedestrian lights give you a feeling for this social proof idea and I think this is absolutely crucial to most metrication programs. All fashion is about social proof. You wear this colour garment this season or this shape of garment this season because others are doing it or because you are a leader in a particular fashion area. And this is, you are providing the leadership and the social proof and others will follow you. You see this with pop groups, um, how people simply go along the way. I saw it this year in a group of the Royal Society. Now the Royal Society seemed, seemed to me all through my life to be a pretty worthwhile organisation for leadership. So I went to their summer science school uh, display this year. It was held at the Royal Society building in London. They had 23 poster displays all around the place. And seven of those poster displays, as soon as I stood there and looked like a farmer from Australia, they dumbed everything down off the board into pounds, ounces, uh, feet and miles. And these are people who are being funded for their PhD programs and their postdoc programs by the Royal Society to progress science as we know it. I was reasonably flattened by that until I realised that they were reacting to what the others were doing around them in dumbing it down because that's what you do when you're dealing with the public. And it's uh, the others are doing it, therefore it's right for me to do. If those people walk across the road, then I'll go too. That sort of stuff. I then came here to the United States and I was invited to speak to a group at the National Institute of Standards and Technology and I talked to uh, the people there and they kindly then showed me around um, various um, sections of NIST. As it happens, I have been a uh, science reporter for the uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Re uh, Industrial Research Organisation in Australia and they showed me how to do some insulation. Now, I worked with an insulation group for about five years, so I know a little bit about it, not much, just a little bit. So I went into the NIST program and this guy tried to tell, or did tell me, about how many British thermal units there were, British thermal units per barrel of oil equivalent. And that was 2007, about <coughs> a week ago. If you look at the, <coughs> the history and so on of social proofs, one of the dramatic things is in suicides, that if uh, uh, media organisations, television, radio and uh, me uh, papers, newspapers, will not give you all the gory details of a suicide because they know full well if they do, within the next couple of weeks, there'll be copycat suicides. Social proof takes all sorts of things. I was reading in the Washington Post an article, again, about two weeks ago, and the Washington Post was giving an, um, uh, uh, an eye, eyeball description, if you like, of the 9-11 people who were jumping out of the buildings in New York. And one of his remarks struck me. I was I'm very despondent about the article anyway, but I, this struck me. He said, they didn't all jump at random. He said, it was almost as if they were waiting until somebody jumped and then they'd all jump together because I'd seen somebody else do it. And oh, that was the end of me. I don't read the Washington Post anymore. It makes me upset. So <clears throat> while I was mucking around doing all of this, I happened to have the chance to go to um, um, Oxford University and investigate the question of who actually invented the international system of units, um, or if you like to call it the modern metric system. And I uh, needed to know what it was, why, when, where, and who did it. And um, what was invented was a decimal system, including decimal money, an international system, a standard length of, as it turned out in 
when I translated it into modern units, it was 997 millimetres, so it was a bit shorter than our present metre. Um, it was based on an idea of a universal measure that you could get anywhere in the world. Um, it was universal also in the sense that it was, you could use it for all human activities. And it also combined all the units so that they were time-based and time and length and area and volume and mass, which they called weight at that time, um, using distilled rainwater, were all coupled together, which we now know to be the case in the modern metric system. And I then looked at why it was done. And why it was done was because this guy was writing an essay towards a real character. And by that he meant a set of, uh, we'd call them letters in our alphabet, but he wanted real characters that would apply to all languages so that he could use a set of characters and write out uh, Hebrew if he wanted or Aramaic or whatever. And he wanted to find the philosophical language and this was his goal. He wasn't writing about measurements. He was writing about a philosophical language because he believed that Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden spoke in a language that was perfect and pure and he was seeking what that language was and what sort of characters it had and how you might look at it. When did he do it? In 1668. When did he do it? On a Monday, I told you that. And it was April the 13th. Um, we know this because um, he did this in Oxford, Cambridge and London and we now know that the metric system was invented in England. Um, this has some interesting repercussions for um, the English people who have uh, decried the metric system because it's foreign. Um, so that's, this is going to be an interesting piece of research. Um, who did it? A fellow by the name of John Wilkins. And why was he so religious? Um, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, um, but he was also Dean of Ripon, which was a... Um, a church uh, in, I think, near London, and later on he was, a, he was promoted to bishop. But he wrote this book, um, and this is the back of the title page, showing when it was sent off to the printer on that Monday I talked to you about. And it was, I think, the third or fourth book that was approved for publication by the Royal Society. Um, and it was a little thin number, 600 pages long. It included... Um, all of the, uh, the basis of Pittman's shorthand. It included all of the basis of Roger's thesaurus. It included a 150-page uh, dictionary of the English language, um, which was, I think, the second dictionary of the English language. This is uh, about 100 years before Dr Johnson did his dictionary of the English language and about 200 years before Noah Webster did his. So... Um, this guy was very early in all of those things. Um, you'll met, remember I said that he was at Oxford and at Cambridge. He's the only man ever who was uh, a, a leader of a college in both Oxford and, and Cambridge. Nobody else has ever done that. He also um, was the, uh, really was the creator of the Royal Society. He had to use people like Brunker uh, as his money men and he got to be president um, where Wilkins was uh, the secretary of that society. This is what his work looked like when he wrote about measure and he described um, the whole of the modern system, international system of units in four and a half pages and a lot of it was spent like here, um, this bit here where really he's, um, all he's showing us there is a thesaurus sort of thing, what one means, it means an ace, it means and stuff like that. Um, and this is the rest of it, and some more, and some more, and the last page, down to halfway down the page. And that described the total modern um, metric system. It's interesting, I wondered then how it got <coughs> from John Wilkins' work in 1668, how it then got to France in the 1790s. And one of the things I realised was that 
I, I had previously read uh, Thomas Jefferson's report to the Congress um, saying what uh, uh, he was recommending a decimal uh, measuring system for the United States of America in 1790. John Wilkins had done his in 1668 and I don't know, and I'm still searching for, how this intriguing um, parallels came about. Both Wilkins and Jefferson uh, were decimal men. They believed in decimals. Both Wilkins and Jefferson um, uh, believed in basing the length of the standard um, uh, universal measure. Um, the universal measure, by the way, is where we got the name metre from. Um, when, the, when universal measure was translated into Italian by Burrattini, um, it was translated as Metro Catholico. Um, so the Metro was where we got the metre from. But both of them had the idea of using a pendulum to be a standard length of a metre. They also both had extremely interesting parallels about what you should call the various parts. Neither of them used the word metre. And what they did do was said that uh, uh, a foot should be 10 inches, a ten, an inch should an inch should be 10 lines. Um, one of them said a line should be 10 points, etc., and so on. Um, the parallels are so great that I need to investigate this further and uh, find out the part that Thomas Jefferson played in this. Thomas Jefferson, you will recall, before he was President of the United States of America, uh, prior to that he was Vice President, uh, prior to that he was Secretary of State, and prior to that he was Ambassador to France. And he was trained almost like an apprentice as ambassador to France by another character by the name of Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin was the man who uh, pushed through the idea of decimal money in the United States. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and his friend George Washington were the people who pushed that through as law in 1790. And that's why the United States got the very first decimal currency in the world that every other nation has now followed. Um, it took us until 1966, we're a bit slow over our side of the pond, but that's the way it went. The metrication process started uh, way back with Fibonacci giving us um, decimal numbers, Simon Stephen with decimal arithmetic, Edmund Gunter, you can look at Edmund Gunter's work any time you like if you're flying in a plane over the United States of America, because it was all surveyed using Edmund Gunter's chain. That's why all those squares are there. Um, it was Mr Gunter. John Wilkins, of course, I've mentioned. Um, Blaise Pascal, if you've got a minute afterwards, I'll show you the first, what I think was the first computer in the world, probably the first calculator. And Blaise Pascal made a decimal calculator in 1640. Thought he was going to make his fortune out of these adding up machines. The only one of those who made a fortune was Simon Stephen, who came up with a set of tables for working out uh, compound interest on money loans. And it was in print probably till 20 or 30 years ago, from uh, 1585. He did all right. Benjamin Franklin was involved in the process, I don't know how, um, but he was very much a decimal uh, promoter and decimal currency promoter. And Thomas Jefferson, I think, was a really, really important character in taking the whole of the decimal system and the metric system back to the French in the 1790s. In Thomas Jefferson's collection, I was in the Library of Congress the other day and they were kind enough to let me have access to Thomas Jefferson's books, the ones that he left from uh, when Library of Congress burnt down in 18, 1812 when the British Army burnt down the Library of Congress. So in about 1814, Thomas Jefferson sold them more or less at cost, his personal library. And what you now see as the Library of Congress is actually Thomas Jefferson's library with a few add-ons. Quite a lot of add-ons, actually. Um, but Thomas Jefferson's library is still there. And I was intrigued to see that there's a book he had... Uh, I think 37 books on arithmetic, and there was one book that he'd notated, what a genius wrote this, what a great book, this is the way to go. 
and it had uh, laid out very, very carefully all of the um, uh, how to add up decimal numbers. Um, and it had numbers like 389 decimal marker uh, 012, and you know, to three, to three decimal places and so on. It was written by a gent gentleman by the name of, this is an arithmetic book, mind you, I didn't know this existed, a gentleman by the name of Isaac Newton. And as a matter of interest, Isaac Newton, when he was writing his uh, um, arithmetic book, used a comma as a uh, decimal marker. Um, didn't know that Newton went in for that. Oh, Isaac Newton, by the way, was a student of John Wilkins. John Wilkins was uh, one of his masters. So back to my earlier point, and then I'll finish up. I've gone far too long. Your metrication is in inevitable. The metrication of Google is inevitable. You can't stop it. Um, you, uh, uh, you can choose slow-going ways of doing it. I wouldn't recommend it or you can choose fast-going ways of doing it, which I would recommend. Um, there's no doubt that you and your children's future will be metric. Um, the whole of the United States, as I see it now, it's more or less, I see company after company after company seething away to get the advantages, the cost advantages and the uh, lack of error advantages and so on within their, within their company structure and in their purchasing. Um, and where they can in their, even in their sales, but none of them want to tell the public about it, or their politicians probably. Um, but you, I think, just because you're here today, you are metrication leaders and you will have a part to play in this. You will um, make the sort of decisions that will play out within Google and you'll decide what you're going to do and you will be the people who do that. So take care. Choose the quick ways, don't go the slow ways. Um, and have a good look at the sorts of things I've been saying today and how they apply to these wonderful principles that you already have here. Um, the, some of them will be in conflict. I uh, um, think um, point three is it democracy and, and measuring systems, since you have to agree on standards, uh, and ways of doing things, um, there may be some conflicts. I'm not much interested in how you resolve those, but those are the sorts of issues that you want to do. If you need any more support from me, I'm happy to give it, and you can find me at these addresses. And uh, if you want to go Google, 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 just get the spelling of Norton right. It's got a T-I-N at the end of it. And thank you very much for your time and your patience. So you talked a bit about um, in going metrics, some of the uh, some standards, is like building construction standards, would change along the way. I guess so. Two questions. One is how important is that to, have to be obviously different uh, as you, you, know, you go completely metric, and then two, how do you deal with the things that aren't there yet? <clears throat> Let me describe the Australian experience first. <clears throat> what happened was the um, metric conversion board that we had. Well, that was our um, political support, our government support, just that it was there. Um, it, it, it provided a cocoon in which the industry could work. The industry then put their heads together. They, they made a committee which was extremely broadly based. Um, they had carpenter, a, a carpenter there who owned his own firm and was going to actually do it. They avoided having somebody like who, the secretary of the uh, the uh, Master Builders Association, because although he nominally had uh, some authority, he didn't have the actual having hands on to do it. There were, were uh, bricklayers there, there were painters there, there were plumbers, there were um, various other people. But the chairman was also a member, he was a, a real estate agent. So they were all looking at cost edges and things that they could get. They also had a technical um, expertise that they could call on of building, uh, they had their own 
building research scientist in their group, but he had access to an entire um, uh, division of about probably 150 research scientists. And so they sat down and they rewrote all the building regulations. Um, and the, that was went through the legislative processes more or less as regulations rather than as uh, blue letter law, you know, the, the difference between the two. But the legislation through the Houses of Parliament wasn't required. They did it all as regulation, um, the Uniform Building Regulations, they're called. And they were signed off uh, nationally and by each state. So we all use the same ones. Pr prior to that, each state had their own. So we used that as an opportunity to make national laws as well. Yeah, there was a cost to it. So uh, one place where everybody still has vocal fractions is in, in time, 24 hours a day, 60 yep. minutes an hour. Um, is there any initiative towards metric time or what is your opinion on it? To the best of my knowledge, there is no um, uh, feasible, I've seen, some, I've seen some good attempts at that, but the social um, issues are going to be far greater than the technical issues. Personally, I think as a step in that direction, this is a pure personal view from Pat Norton, I have a problem as a practical builder that the metric system, the international system of units, the SI, none of those gives me something that I use as a builder every day. And that's a right angle. That's a right angle, that's a wrong angle. Right? And I like right angles. And right angles, there isn't one in, uh, in the metric system. They have a radian, which is a, a ratio thing, um, but curiously, when the French uh, realised the problem with the pendulum method of getting a uh, universal measure, they decided to uh, do a measure of the, um, a line of longitude as long as they could. So they started theoretically in Barcelona in Spain and went right through up to Dunkirk, I think it was, at the north end of... Uh, France, as far as they could go, but they were really dealing with the qu a quadrant of the Earth, a right angle. Um, and one of the reasons I think they chose that was that in 1790, all the rage around the world, I mean, um, computers and uh, uh, Google technology and these are buzz technologies of the now, right now, today, but in 1790, Go back 20 years, <clears throat> they had only just discovered that measuring time around the world would give them latitude things. Um, the uh, watch that um, Harrison made had only just been done 30 or 40 years beforehand. Uh, James Cook had only just started to map the whole of the Pacific and the Northern Atlantic uh, Ocean and so on. Um, so all of those issues were happening then, but they never took to that quadrant. Think of a quadrant divided into a thousand parts. Let's call the unit of one quadrant, let's call it a quad, and then divide it into milliquads. Then the whole time issue becomes a separate one. Angles is probably more important in buildings and so on, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think I answered your question. I don't think I can. Anybody else? So one of the things that we're seeing as uh, computers become popular is the uh, the binary system. Uh, yep. And since that's based on a power of two, you get two to the tenth as 1,024. It's almost 1,000. So we say 1,000 bytes or a kilobyte, even though it's a little bit more. And as these numbers get larger, you know, you get up to a gigabyte, th these fractions are actually adding up and it's creating some discrepancies. For example, yep. hmm. if you buy a gigabyte hard drive, that's actually, you know, a billion bytes on the drive, whereas your operating system is going to expect the extra fraction there. Um, so we're seeing occasional discrepancies here. Do you have any yep. advice for how to deal with that, or should I we just tell the world the, to go I think it was two? the IEEE um, has already addressed that issue. 
and they came up with a new set of uh, um, uh, prefixes that instead of being, say, uh, kilo uh, is a thousand, so a kilometre is a thousand metres, they came up with something called a kibby, I think it is. Somebody else will know about it. And it's 1,024. Um, and gibbies, mibbies and such like. Um, look for those. Um, and I think it was IEEE that did it, but not my area. Over here, I think, um, please, Paul. Hey, thanks. Uh, you mentioned some time ago that um, metric units resulted in vastly less waste in the construction industry. Could you give some examples of how that savings comes about? Um, a number of ways. First of all, simply errors in measurement. To measure in feet and inches and fractions of inches are uh, inherently difficult and you make cuts that aren't necessary, they're too short or something and you waste a whole piece and so on. I've done that and done that a lot. Um, the uh, other thing they did was uh, to get, say, uh, a piece uh, two before was always nominal. Um, and so the actual two before uh, might start at three and five eighths or something. Um, and then the next piece you pick up might be three and seven eighths. So to get a smooth wall, you had to pad some of them with some sort of, like, uh, uh, plywood or something. And other times, you'd have a bow in it or you'd have a... Uh, and then you'd have to plane it all off so that you had flat surfaces. And when you put uh, the... Pl pl um, talking Australian now, plaster sheet, I think you call it drywall. When you put that on, you've got to have flat surfaces. So uh, you had to pad or plane or whatever. And there was a lot of time spent. And I think most of the savings were in better quality um, of materials because they were built to tighter specifications. So when you buy a piece of 90 millimetre uh, scantling in Australia, it's 90 millimetres. It's, <laughs> it, it, that's what they aim for, that's what you get. Thanks. Thank you all. It's a delight being here.